Section zero of an interpretation of Keats Endymion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug. An interpretation of Keats Endymion by Henry Clement Notcut, Professor of English, University of Stellenbosch, South Africa. Introduction A careful study of Endymion, made some ten years ago, led to the conclusion that there was more of allegorical significance in the poem than had hitherto been recognised. But the effort to trace that significance was only partially successful. Further study since that time has gradually opened up the way to the interpretation that is worked out in the following pages. It is probable that there are details in the story, the meaning of which still lies hidden, but it may at least be hoped that enough has been discovered to win for the poem its rightful place among the not very numerous examples in English poetry of well-wrought allegory. It will be seen that frequent reference has been made to Sir Sidney Colvin's recently published Life of Keats, 2nd edition, 1918 which has superseded all other authorities on the subject, and, while the interpretation of Endymion, here put forward, differs largely from his treatment of that poem, it is pleasant to have the opportunity of giving expression to the deep sense of gratitude which all lovers of Keats must feel for his scholarly and sympathetic work. Stellenbosch, South Africa, 10th of March, 1919 it is a strange habit of wise humanity to speak in enigmas only, so that the highest truths and usefulest laws must be hunted for through whole picture galleries of dreams, which to the vulgar seem dreams only. Ruskin An Interpretation of Keats' Endymion Endymion and Allegory It is generally agreed that in writing Endymion, Keats intended to do something more than merely to retell an old legend. He does not appear, so far as the records go, to have left any definite statement to that effect, but there are indications that point distinctly to such a purpose. The poem beginning, I stood tiptoe upon a little hill, with which his first volume, published in March 1817, opens, had originally been called Endymion, but was afterwards left without a title, because Keats had decided to make a more ambitious effort to handle the same subject. And the significant fact, for our present purpose, is that the earlier Endymion, while it touches lightly upon the old legend, is really concerned with the views of Keats on the philosophy of poetry. It would not then be surprising to find that the longer and more ambitious treatment of the story, upon which he set to work as soon as the earlier volume had appeared, embodied his views on the same subject, handled this time in a fuller and more elaborate manner. It is perhaps worth noting how much of his verse is concerned with this one theme, the training and function of the poet. In the volume of 1817, besides I Stood Tiptoe, the epistles to his brother George, to Matthew, and to Cowden Clark, and the more important Sleep and Poetry, all deal with this matter and in one of his latest pieces of work, The Fall of Hyperion, he returns once more to the same theme. It is interesting also to find his thoughts on other matters running into the form of allegory during the time when he was working on the first book of Endymion. In May, 1817, he writes to Taylor and Hesse, who afterwards published the poem, that he could make a nice little allegorical poem called The Dun, where we would have the castle of carelessness, the drawbridge of credit, so novelty fashions expedition against the city of tailors, etc., etc., and turns immediately afterwards to the subject of Endymion. Lastly, it may be noted that there is a passage in the first book which might of itself almost settle the question of the real significance of the poem. It occurs in the talk of Endymion with Peona, lines 769 and following, and in it the mask is for the moment laid aside, and Keats himself speaks out in his own proper person. He asks, 
wherein lies happiness and goes on to answer in that which becks our ready minds to fellowship divine a fellowship with essence till we shine full alchemized and free of space he proceeds to mark off the various grades of happiness starting from the sympathy that can enter into the wonders and aspirations of former days and passing on through friendship to love which may produce more than our searching witnesseth and if earthly love he goes on to say can lift us far above the ordinary level of life what power must lie in a passionate endeavour to reach up to a divine ideal it is fortunate that a record remains showing that keats attached particular importance to this passage the lines quoted above were not in the original poem and in sending them to his publisher as the poem was passing through the press he wrote he must indulge me by putting this in for setting aside the badness of the other such a preface is necessary to the subject the whole thing must i think have appeared to you who are a consecutive man as a thing almost of mere words but i can assure you that when i wrote it it was a regular stepping of the imagination towards a truth my having written that argument will perhaps be of the greatest service to me of anything i ever did it set before me the gradations of happiness even like a kind of pleasure thermometer and is my first step towards the chief attempt in the drama it is evident then that there was much more in the mind of keats when he wrote this poem than the retelling of an old and fantastic tale but of course the final justification for this view of endymion must lie in the poem itself if as it is hoped to show there is to be found running beneath the surface of the poem in a clear and unbroken stream a meaning that corresponds closely with the ideas that are known to have filled the mind of keats at this time there will be no need of further argument on the matter an allegory of this kind does not slip into a poem by accident but it may fairly be asked why did not keats himself do something to elucidate the meaning of a poem which though it cost him so much effort seems to have been understood by few if indeed by any in his own time and which even at this later day has scarcely yielded up its full treasure of meaning two facts may supply a sufficient answer to this query the first is that before he had finished the poem keats became dissatisfied with and tired of it this feeling shows itself repeatedly in his letters soon after he had reached the end of the third book he wrote to hayden my ideas with respect to it i assure you are very low and i would write the subject thoroughly again but i am tired of it and think the time would be better spent in writing a new romance which i have in my eyes for the next summer and some time later to reynolds i have copied my fourth book and shall write the preface soon i wish it was all done for i want to forget it and make my mind free for something new and then the unintelligent and unfair criticism with which the poem was received by most of those who noticed it and what was almost worse the indifference of the greater part of the literary world would offer but a slender inducement to enter upon an explanation of its meaning if even the few friends who took up his defence failed to interpret it rightly what could be expected from those who began to read it with minds prejudiced against the author so he held his peace he probably felt as unwilling to explain his allegory as a humorist would be to explain one of his jokes that had fallen flat and moreover he would know that any such defence would only give occasion for fresh ridicule the main intention accepting the presence of an allegory as a working hypothesis we may next try to define its main intention it is true that any attempt to state in matter-of-fact prose the significance of an allegory must inevitably be unsatisfactory a painting of a sunset or of waves breaking on the shore is unsatisfactory for how can one reproduce on canvas the constantly shifting play of light and colour which makes the real beauty of the scene yet we find pleasure in the attempt and in the case of the allegory where a more purely intellectual element is involved an attempt to define its purpose has a real value in clearing one's way towards an understanding of the problems involved 
Definitions and Criticisms Professor de Selincourt has described the allegory as representing the development of the poet's soul towards a complete realisation of itself. Mr. A. C. Bradley says, The adventures of Endymion are also the experiences of the poetic soul in its search for union with the absolute beauty. So Sidney Colvin gives a fuller definition. The essence of Keats' task is to set forth the craving of the poet for full communion with the essential spirit of beauty in the world, and the discipline by which he is led, through the exercise of the active human sympathies and the toilsome acquisition of knowledge, to the prosperous and beatific achievement of his quest. Each of these writers, however, proceeds to remark upon the imperfect way in which the intention has been carried out. Professor de Selincourt, after a brief sketch of the purpose of the poem, adds, It is hardly safe to give a more detailed interpretation of the allegory, for, as a whole, Endymion is vague and obscure. Sir Sidney Colvin, while in some places taking up a more thorough-going attitude of defence than previous writers had adopted, yet says, In Endymion, Keats had impeded and confused his narrative by working into it much incident and imagery symbolic of the cogitations and aspirations, the upliftings and misgivings of his own unripe spirit, and quotes with approval Shelley's remark, I think if he had printed about fifty pages of fragments from it, I should have been led to admire Keats as a poet more than I ought, of which there is now no danger. Mr. A. C. Bradley is more severe. The result is a series of adventures, to the details of which it is impossible to assign a distinct symbolic meaning, and which, taken more simply, have the incoherence of a broken dream. But there are many faults of expression, and not a few lapses from good taste, in all the earlier work of Keats, cannot be denied. An endymion is by no means free from these defects, but it is hoped to show that there is a fuller and more consecutive meaning running through the whole poem than has yet been recognised, that many of the details, which have been thought to be superfluous and unmeaning, are significant and appropriate when viewed from the right standpoint, and that much of the criticism that has been directed against it is mistaken and irrelevant since it is based upon a failure to understand the meaning and purpose of the passages criticised. A Double Purpose In trying to arrive at a satisfactory statement of the underlying meaning of the poem, it is necessary to recognise that the allegory appears to have a double purpose, to carry at once a wider and a narrower meaning, the wider meaning having reference to the new birth of poetry, which came about as soon as the power of the pseudo-classical school declined and English poetry was released from what Keats regarded as the cramping and deadening influence that Pope and his associates had exercised, the narrower being intended to give some account of the experience of an individual, picturing the rise and development of the poetic passion in his mind, his earnest pursuit and gradual realisation of the ideal that is set before him. In some parts of the poem, the two ideas can be recognised side by side, but usually one or the other is dominant for the time. Thus, in the first book, the earlier part is a picture of the spirit of the time in which the revival of poetry began, while the rest of the book deals with the more personal aspect of the subject. One need not be surprised to find this double purpose at work. Keats was an enthusiastic admirer of Spencer, and the Fairy Queen would furnish him with a precedent that would be warrant enough for such a plan. It would indeed have been difficult to keep the two ideas apart from one another, for the impulses that were stirring in the mind of Keats and were urging him on to develop his own gift of song were but part of the great tidal movement that was flooding in through many channels, and he was clear-sighted enough to recognise the fact. If we look at the sonnet that he addressed to Hayden in a letter of November 1816, Great spirits now on earth are sojourning, in which he refers to Wordsworth, Lee Hunt, and Hayden himself as pioneers of a new era, and then read another letter addressed to Hayden in the following May, when working at Endymion, in which he quotes the following lines of Love's Labours Lost. Let fame, that all pant after in their lives, 
live registered upon our brazen tombs and so grace us in the disgrace of death and adds to think that i have no right to couple myself with you in this speech would be death to me we can see how he thought of his own ambitions and ideals as connected with the wider movement that he saw to be in progress not as a matter of boasting but as a recognition of simple fact it may further be noted that the same collocation of ideas is to be found in sleep and poetry which had been published a little while before he seriously took up the writing of endymion in this poem he had denounced in terms that roused the wrath of byron those that went about holding a poor decrepit standard out marked with most flimsy mottoes and in large the name of one boileau and had gone on to celebrate the advent of happier times now tis a fairer season and then had linked with all this the hope that he himself might be found worthy to play some part in this great poetic revival we may now try to ascertain what light can be gained on the purpose of the poem from a closer examination of the text End of section. Section one of An Interpretation of Keats and Dimion by Henry Clement Notcut. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book one. The story. The story, so far as it is developed in the first book, falls into two clearly marked divisions. The first of these covering about one-third of the total length of the book, line 63 to 393, describes the Festival of Pan. The second, lines 393 to 992, deals with the strange experiences which have changed the life of Endymion. It will be convenient to consider these separately. The Festival of Pan It is on the side of Mount Latmos, near the western coast of Asia Minor, that the festival is about to be held. On the slopes of the mountain lay a dense forest, into some parts of which no man had penetrated. Line 67. Sometimes a lamb, straying away from the flock to which it belonged, would be lost in the depths of the forest, but it was believed that such a lamb would be shielded from harm until it joined the herds of Pan, and that the shepherd who had lost it would gain thereby. Line 78. There were many paths in the forest leading to a wide lawn, in the midst of which stood an altar, line 90. To this spot, early in the morning of a summer day, a troop of children came and gathered round the altar, and, as they stood expectant, a faint breath of music came to their ears, line 114. Soon there appeared a troop of maidens and of shepherds, then a venerable priest, followed by more shepherds, and a joyous multitude accompanying a chariot drawn by three steeds, in which rode Endymion, their prince. They were gathered round the shrine, while the priest exhorted them to join in giving thanks to Pan for all the benefits they had received. After sacrifice and libation, a hymn to Pan was sung, line 232, and then many of those present joined in dancing and sports, while others allowed their minds to dwell on thoughts and images called up by what was going on around them, and as they played, or meditated, the sun arose in all his glory. Line 350. On one side sat a group of old men, who were talking with one another about the next life, the duties that lay before them, and the hopes of reunion with those they had loved. The Meaning It may be admitted at the outset that this earlier part of the first book is not the most hopeful part of the poem in which to attempt the tracing of the allegory. As an introduction to the story, it is simple and effective, but indications that would point out the purpose beneath the surface of the narrative are not easy to find. By making use, however, of clues to be found in later parts of the poem, we can arrive at a fair degree of certainty as to the intention of this earlier part. A widespread poetic feeling. It appears, then, that we have here shown to us, in the manner of a picture, the feeling that was abroad among men at the time when the new romantic movement began to exercise its influence. It is not only in the mind of the poet 
that such a movement stirs and grows, there must be a stirring, too, in the minds of many others who will never be poets, and they must be ready to share in the new ideas and emotions in such degree as they are capable of. For some time past, men had paid little heed to the beauty of the world around them. As Wordsworth had put it when Keats was twelve years old, Little we see in nature that is ours. We have given our hearts away, a sordid boon. This sea that bears her bosom to the moon, the winds that will be howling at all hours, and are upgathered now like sleeping flowers. For this, for everything, we are out of tune. It moves us not. And it was a true charge that the old priest made when he said, Our vows are wanting to our great god Pan. Line 213 But a change was coming over the minds of men. They were tired of the wrangling and the strife, the insincere compliment and the bitter jibe that made up so large a part of what poets had for a long time been saying to them. They were eager to respond to Wordsworth's invitation. Come forth into the light of things, let nature be your teacher. They were ready to join in the desire that this new spirit of delight in and wonder at all that is beautiful and mysterious in nature might spread among mankind. They could sing. Be still the leaven that, spreading in this dull and clodded earth, gives it a touch ethereal, a new birth. Be still a symbol of immensity, a firmament reflected in a sea. Line 296 The main purpose of this opening part of the story is to show the new movement as one that was shared by many people, young and old, men, women and children were alike stirred by it, and the suggestion at the back of the story is that the change that came about in the world of poetry at this time was not merely the result of new ideas and a fresh outlook on the part of the poets, it was the expression of a spiritual change that had taken place in the minds of large numbers of people. The revelation had come to the poet, as we shall see, in a way that was intimate and personal, and no one else could directly share in it, but there were many who, though quite unable to receive such a revelation as had come to him, still felt the throbbing of new impulses and shared in the new joy. The Altar and the Lawn the revival of the worship of Pan stands for the fresh interest in and love of nature which were widely diffused at the time of the poetic revival, and bearing this in mind, a further significance may be recognised in some of the details of the story. It will be remembered that a marble altar, line 90, stood in the middle of the wide lawn, line 82, where this festival took place and that there were many paths leading through the forest to this spot. It would appear that Keats intended to remind us that reverence for nature is no new thing. This part of the great domain of poetry had been opened up long before many paths led to it, and had been trodden by worshippers in earlier times. The altar that they had built, though it had been neglected for some time, still stood there, ready for the worshippers when they were willing to gather round it. It may be noted, too, that it was before sunrise that the multitude came together to renew their vows to Pan, and then, from the horizon's vaulted side, there shot a golden splendour far and wide, spangling those million poutings of the brine with quivering awe. T'was even an awful shrine from the exaltation of Apollo's bow, a heavenly beacon in their dreary woe. Line 349. So the beginning of the freshly awakened interest in nature, as may be seen in the poems of Thompson and Collins and Gray, showed itself before the sunshine splendour of the new movement as it shone forth in the time of Wordsworth and Coleridge. It is difficult, if not impossible, to mark with accuracy the limits of significance intended by the poet in the details of his allegory. One cannot, for instance, be certain whether or not he meant the mighty forest outspread upon the sides of Latmos to represent the realm of poetry as a whole, and the gloomy shades sequestered deep where no man went, line 67. 
to stand for some portions of that realm which Keats thought of as still remaining to be occupied, themes or aspects of life which were awaiting the poet of the future, in contrast with the lawn into which many paths led, and where stood the altar to Pan, at which many poets had sacrificed. But there are a few lines, not in the main current of the story, in which we shall probably not be far wrong in recognising a partly personal reminiscence, also aside from the direct line of the allegory. The Strayed Lambs They refer to the lamb that sometimes strayed far down those inmost glens, line 69, and never returned to join the flocks, but passed unworried by angry wolf or parred with prying head, until it came to some unfooted plains where fed the herds of Pan. Ay, great his gains, who thus one lamb did lose. Line 75 It seems likely that Keats was thinking of the fate of some of his own poems. There were many lambs in the white flock of his first published volume that had been worried by the angry wolves or pards with prying head, who howled in the pages of the Eclectic Review and other periodicals, at Lee Hunt and all who were suspected of being his friends. But there were other poems that he did not publish, some perhaps had not even been put into writing, and these were never, in his lifetime at any rate, gathered into the pens that held the main flock. Keats, regarding them in a way with which Browning would have fully sympathised, felt that these poems had not perished, but had joined the herds of Pan, and that the gain to him was great, for they lived on in his mind as beautiful ideals, unmarred by foolish or unfriendly criticism. There is, of course, no need to suppose that Keats intended to limit the application of the parable to his own experience. Many a poet must have had a similar feeling about his unpublished poems. Endymion's Experiences Thus far we have followed the story of the Festival of Pan. It remains to consider the latter part of the first book, which tells of the experiences through which Endymion had passed, and which had caused such a marked change in his demeanour. In earlier days he had been foremost in all active exercises, but now he seemed to be oppressed by some secret grief, and could not join in the festivities of the day. Line 393. His sister Piona drew him from the crowd, and took him to a quiet retreat, where, under her restful influence, he fell asleep. Line 442. When he awoke, refreshed, and grateful for her sisterly affection, he told her the cause of the change that had come upon him. He had seen a vision of surpassing loveliness, line 572, and, though it was but a dream, and had passed away, leaving him desolate, it had been followed by a second appearance of the same bright face, mirrored in a clear well, line 895. This was no dream, for he saw it with waking eyes, but it, too, had quickly vanished. Finally, as he was one day following the course of a stream, he had reached a quiet and beautiful cave, line 935, and, as he longed, with a great longing for the presence of the unknown goddess, whom he had come to love so deeply, he heard her voice calling him, and realised that she was with him once more. But those moments had quickly fled, and feeling now the hopelessness of his passion, he declared that he would put his grief aside and return to a quiet and wholesome life. Keats' Early Interests In this part of the story, it is not difficult to trace Keats' own reminiscences of the way in which there gradually grew up within him the conviction that he must devote himself to the pursuit of poetry, until that became at length the one absorbing passion of his life. Endymion's days, as he himself tells us, had, until recently, been marked by healthy activity. He was full of energy and delighted in manly exercises. He was one who, for very sport of heart, would race with his own steed from Araby, pluck down a vulture from his towery perching, frown a lion into growling. Line 533. And Keats, according to the account of his school friends, 
showed a similar disposition in his early days. One of them, Mr. Edward Holmes, has left the following record. Keats was in childhood not attached to books. His penchant was for fighting. He would fight anyone, morning, noon and night, his brother among the rest. It was meat and drink to him. He was not literary. His love of work and poetry manifested itself chiefly about the year before he left school. In all active exercises, he excelled. But a change had come over Endymion. He no longer took any interest in the manly sports that had hitherto been his chief delight. He had lost all his toil-breeding fire, line 537, and at times he became oblivious of all that was going on around him. He did not heed the sudden silence, or the whispers low, or the old eyes dissolving at his woe, or anxious calls, or close of trembling palms, or maiden sigh that grief itself embalms. But in the selfsame fixed trance he kept, like one who on the earth had never stepped. Line 398 His love of poetry awakened. So Keats pictures to us the change that comes over a man's outlook on life when once he has heard the call to devote himself to the pursuit of poetry. Hitherto he has led a life, not differing in any marked way from the life of his fellows. He has joined in the same pursuits and has shared in their interests and pleasures. But when once he has caught a glimpse of an ideal loftier and more beautiful than anything that has hitherto entered into his conception of life, he cannot go on as before. The old pursuits and pleasures seem empty and meaningless. He becomes absorbed in the contemplation of the new ideal. It fascinates him and alters his whole attitude to life. Endymion speaks of the change wrought suddenly in me, line 520, and though it is not for a long time that he fully makes up his mind to devote himself to the pursuit of the new ideal, it is clear that Keats intends us to think of the experience that resulted in the new outlook upon life as having taken place on some definite and identifiable occasion. His Isolation It may further be noted that the experience is a rare one. Not many men are called to be poets, and in the story it is Endymion alone of all the people who sees the vision and hears the call. For the most part, the people around him are quite unable to enter into his feelings, though there are a few of more sympathetic understanding who are able to share a little in them. He seemed, to common lookers-on, like one who dreamed of idleness in groves Elysian. But there were some who feelingly could scan a lurking trouble in his nether lip and see that oftentimes the reins would slip through his forgotten hands. Then would they sigh, and think of yellow leaves, of owlets cry, of logs piled solemnly. Line 175 This isolation of the poet, the solitariness of the path that he has to follow through life, is a point frequently insisted upon in the allegory. It is a pathetic illustration of the limited degree of sympathetic understanding with which the poet must expect to meet, that when Keats read to Wordsworth this beautiful hymn to Pan, a crystal vase containing as a distilled essence the very flower of Wordsworth's own teaching, all the comment that he passed upon it seems to have been that it was a pretty piece of paganism. Wordsworth, who had himself declared that he would rather be a pagan suckled in a creed outworn, if only his eyes and ears might be open to the beauty and mystery of the world around him. If this was all the appreciation that Wordsworth had to offer, it seems unreasonable to speak severely of the obtuseness of later critics, and even a quarterly reviewer should be pitied rather than blamed. The Threefold Revelation The story of the threefold revelation that was granted to Endymion is skilfully worked out. It is obviously intended to represent the growth in a man's mind of the consciousness that he is called to be a poet. It may be true that the poet is born, not made, but, at any rate, he is not conscious of the fact when he is born, nor for some time after. He may arrive at the consciousness in various ways, but Keats represents it here as coming to him, first of all, 
on a few definite occasions, and in such a way that, from the time when the idea first dawned upon him, his whole outlook upon life was changed, even though some considerable time went by, before he finally made up his mind to devote his life to this one purpose. There are four aspects of this part of the story that appear to be specially significant, and these may now be considered. The First Vision in a Familiar Spot 1. In the first place it will be noticed that some stress is laid on the fact that when the new revelation came to Endymion, he was in a place that he had often been accustomed to visit. On the first occasion, he was on the border of a wood, where the river winds round it, and there he had made his way to a nook, where he had been used to pass his weary eves, line 546, and from which he had often watched the beauty of sunset. And it was here, heralded by the sudden blossoming of a magic bed of flowers, that the vision came to him. The Second In the account of the second revelation, this feature of the story is dwelt upon at greater length. It was in a deep hollow, overarched by bushes and trees, where some moulded steps led down to the margin of a well. Line 870 From there he had often brought flowers to Peona. There, too, he would bubble up the water through a reed, or make ships, of moulted feathers, touchwood, alder chips, with leaves stuck in them, and the Neptune bee of their petty ocean. Line 882 when, in a less childish mood, he often sat there, contemplating the figure's wild, of o'erhead clouds melting the mirror through. Line 886. It may be regarded as one of the canons in the interpretation of allegory that if apparently disproportionate stress is laid upon any aspect of the story, there is probably enshrined in it something of special significance in the allegory. In a carelessly constructed allegory, this will not, of course, hold good. But the more one examines this poem, the more evidence one finds that the thinking has been close and consecutive, and that while the expression is in places immature and faulty, the conception is fine and much more carefully worked out than has yet been admitted. In this instance, the meaning is not difficult to trace, and it is of sufficient importance to justify the stress laid upon the matter. Keats appears to be telling us something of what led up to his realisation of the wonderful beauty of real poetry. As a child, he had, no doubt, often heard or read, and probably learned, poems or parts of poems. He had, perhaps, amused his sister in her baby days by repeating these to her, just as in later days he wrote nonsense rhymes for her. He may, very likely, have imitated verses of the great poets, picking up a feather malted from one of their poems, a chip from their workshop, and making out of it a little craft of his own. In later days he would sit pondering on the way in which life is mirrored in such works, and it was here, on ground long familiar to him, in poems that he had known from childhood, that there came to him, suddenly and unexpectedly, a vision of the indescribable beauty that inspires all really great poetry. It is not an uncommon experience. Many of us have learned in childhood poems that have given us some degree of pleasure at the time, and then, in later years, we have one day found in them a charm of form and meaning that we never realised before. There is granted to us a glimpse of the beauty of poetry in itself, and we share, in some small degree, in the experience of Keats but it is only a very few who are capable of seeing it as he saw it, or in whom it can arouse such an intensity of wonder and delight that it inspires them to make an endymion of it. The Third, On New Ground In contrast with the familiarity of the ground on which endymion had met with these experiences, we find that the spot where the third revelation came to him is not spoken of as one of his earlier haunts, this time he has been hurling his lance from place to place and following at chance. Line 929 Till at last it struck through some young trees and fell into a brook which led him to a cave. 
and the description suggests that all this part of the forest was new to him. It may well have been the case that after Keats had twice been surprised by the recognition of some unearthly beauty in poems that had for a long time been familiar to him, he began to read more widely, to wander at random through the realms of gold, and that in some place that he hit upon, almost by chance, there came to him, again, and more clearly than before, the sense of the surpassing loveliness to be met with in poetry. A Solitary Experience Two. A more obvious point than the one dealt with above is the solitary character of these experiences. On each occasion Endymion was wandering quite alone when the revelation came to him, and this suggests one aspect of the experience through which the poet must pass. The inspirations that come to him, the visions of beauty that he sees, are intensely personal and individual experiences. Even if his day should be spent in a crowded city, in his poetic life no one can go with him. He may tell the story of it to others, but they can never share it. The vision is for him alone. The Revelations Progressive 3. A point that is well worked out is the progressive character of these experiences. Endymion's attention was, first of all, caught by a sudden blossoming of flowers in a familiar spot. He pondered over it until his head was dizzy and distraught. Line 565. At length he fell asleep, and then there came the vision, first of the moon. She did soar so passionately bright, my dazzled soul commingling with her argent spheres did roll through clear and cloudy. Line 593. And when she vanished, there came in her place one who seemed the high perfection of all sweetness. Line 607. Yet it was but a dream. Line 574. On the second occasion, he was sitting near the well when a cloudy cupid flew by, and he was just about to follow it when he saw the same bright face he tasted in his sleep, smiling in the clear well. Line 895. There is no suggestion this time of the distraction and confusion of mind that marked the former occasion, and, moreover, the vision appears to him not when he is asleep, but in his waking hours, and is followed by indications of the divine favour that are unmistakable. The third appearance comes when he is consciously longing for the presence of her who has become his ideal, and it shows a further advance in the fact that on this occasion he hears a voice calling to him, and is granted a fuller and more intimate revelation than before. Thus Keats has represented to us the way in which the poet gradually comes to a fuller realisation of what it is that he is called to do. He sees more and more clearly the beauty of the ideal that is set before him, and is filled more and more with a longing to attain it. It will be seen that a further stage in the realisation of the ideal is represented in the next book. Book 2, lines 714 to 827, while a final consummation is reached at the end of the poem. 4. Between these times of exultation, Endymion sank into a mood of deep depression that gradually subsided into a quiet state of resignation as he made up his mind to put aside all thoughts of the ideal that seemed so impossible of attainment, and tried to resume his ordinary life and then this contentment would be broken up by a fresh vision. This alternation between joyous hope and black despair is, of course, characteristic of the artistic temperament, and is one of the penalties that the poet has to pay for the sensitiveness without which he could not be a poet. But one cannot help suspecting that personal reminiscence played a large part in this phase of the story. Is Keats describing his own experience? And this brings us to the consideration of a question that cannot but arise as one endeavours to follow out the meaning of this poem. The question, that is, as to how far the experiences of Endymion represent the training and development of the poet in general, and how far they correspond to the personal experiences of Keats. 
The question is one that can never be fully answered. Keats himself is the only one who could have told us how far he was drawing upon memories of what he himself had gone through, and he has not spoken. Of his letters that have come down to us, only twenty-four belong to the period before he had finished Endymion, and these throw no direct and but little indirect light on the problem. On the other hand, a little consideration serves to show that in dealing with such a theme he must inevitably have drawn mainly upon his own experience. The only poet whose mind he could know with sufficient intimacy was himself. He was indeed friendly, in varying degrees, with Lee Hunt, with Shelley, and with Wordsworth, and it is quite possible that in the many talks that Keats enjoyed with one or another of these, talks of which a few faint echoes have reached our ears, some ideas may have been thrown up that have been built into the structure of Endymion. Be this as it may, one can hardly doubt that the story of Endymion's effort to win the prize that was set before him is drawn, in the main, from the recollections that filled the mind of Keats of his own hopes and doubts and difficulties, and there are some parts of the story in which the identification is clear. The resemblance between the Endymion of the days before the visions, when his delight was in the exercise of physical energy, and Keats in his earlier school days, when he excelled in all active exercises, and was not literary, has already been pointed out. And the parallel is the more striking, because there is no reason whatever to suppose that it was in the mind of Mr. Holmes when he wrote down his recollection of Keats as he knew him at the age of fourteen. No less striking is the evidence of the change that came over Keats in the course of the next five or six years. Henry Stevens, one of the medical students who shared a room with him in London, has described his point of view in those days. Poetry was, to his mind, the zenith of all his aspirations, the only thing worthy of the attention of superior minds, so he thought. All other pursuits were mean and tame. He had no idea of fame or greatness, but as it was connected with the pursuits of poetry or the attainment of poetical excellence. If the free and active life of Endymion in his earlier days is a reflection of the way in which Keats felt when he was fourteen, it is equally clear that the visions of divine beauty that came to Endymion afterwards, and the rapture that they aroused in him, represent the feelings with regard to poetry and poetic fame that, at this later period, dominated the mind of Keats. Of the intervening period there is scarcely any record, but one can feel little doubt that when we read the story of the way in which Endymion passed from the heights of enthusiasm to the depths of depression, and of the efforts that he made to recover a normal and reasonable frame of mind, we are learning of the inner experiences of the poet. Between the time of his leaving school, about August 1811, and the day when he dropped his medical studies and finally made up his mind to devote himself to poetry, about March 1817, he must have passed through many periods of doubt and uncertainty, of longing to reach the ideal that he saw shining before him, of despair at the poor prospects of attaining to it when he realised the feebleness of his own early efforts. He must have decided more than once to put it all on one side, and to fall in with the wishes of those of his friends who were urging him to complete his medical studies. No more, says Endymion to Peona, will I count over, link by link, my chain of grief, no longer strive to find a half-forgetfulness in mountain wind blustering about my ears. I, thou shalt see, dearest of sisters, what my life shall be, what a calm round of hours shall make my days, there is a paley flame of hope that plays where'er I look, but yet I'll say tis naught, and here I bid it die. Have I not caught already a more healthy countenance? Line 978 It is only in the pages of Endymion that the record of these perplexities and struggles may be found, but a late echo of them survives in a letter to Lee Hunt, written in May 1817, soon after he had begun to work at this poem. I vow that I have been down in the mouth lately at this work. The last two days, however, I have felt more confident. I have asked myself so often 
why I should be a poet more than other men, seeing how great a thing it is, how great things are to be gained by it, what a thing to be in the mouth of fame, that at last the idea has grown so monstrously beyond my seeming power of attainment that the other day I nearly consented myself to drop into a phaeton. A wider meaning. It would, however, be a mistake to push this identification too far. At certain points in the story, both in this book and later, it seems clear that Keats is drawing largely upon the memory of his own experiences in order to make his sketch more vivid and true. But it would misrepresent the purpose of the poem to suppose that Endymion regularly stands for Keats himself. He embodies a more general conception, and his story is intended to picture for us the kind of experience through which any poet who is worthy of the name must pass, while at times he represents a still wider idea, that of the spirit of the new Romanticism. Piona It remains to consider briefly the character of Piona and her significance in the story. She is represented as being devotedly attached to Endymion. When the trouble of his mind so weighed upon him that he lost all consciousness of those about him, it was she who led him away and soothed him into a refreshing sleep. She watched over him while he slept, and when he awoke she sang to soothe him, and then begged him to tell her what it was that had so strangely altered his character. But when he had told her of his wonderful dream, she quite failed to understand how such an experience could affect him so deeply. Is this the cause, this all? Yet it is strange and sad, alas, the one who through this middle earth should pass, most like a sojourning demigod, and have his name upon the harp-string, should achieve no higher bard than simple maidenhood, singing alone and fearfully. Line 721 How light must dreams themselves be, seeing they're more slight than the mere nothing that engenders them. Then, wherefore sully the entrusted gem of high and noble life with thoughts so sick? Why pierce high-fronted honour to the quick for nothing but a dream? Line 754 Endymion replied with some energy, but even after he had told her of the two later revelations, Fiona gave no sign that she was able to enter into his feelings, and her influence so far prevailed that he was ready, at any rate for the moment, to return to the normal life of healthy activity from which he had so strangely been drawn away. Fiona stands for a type of person whom we all know and admire. Simple, practical, unimaginative, but at the same time unselfish and affectionate. They form a most wholesome element in the scheme of life. We owe them more than we can tell. They have no glimpse of the meaning or power of lofty and far-away ideals. They believe in doing the practical duty that lies close at hand. They rejoice when they can draw the unpractical idealist down to the wholesome level of a quiet everyday life. But when they fail to do this, they are no less ready to hover round with ministering cheerfulness. They may at times express a gentle surprise at, or even disapproval of, the wild unreasonableness of the dreamer. But the best of them, in whose number Piona may be reckoned, do not worry him, but, accepting the matter as being beyond their ken, retire into silent sympathy and practical helpfulness. Georgiana Keats One cannot tell whether Keats had any actual person in mind in drawing the portrait of Piona. There is an interesting passage in a letter that he wrote to his friend Bailey, not long after Endymion had appeared, in which he speaks of his brother George's wife. They had recently been married, and were on the point of leaving for America. I had known my sister-in-law some time before she was my sister, and was very fond of her. I like her better and better. She is the most disinterested woman I ever knew. That is to say, she goes beyond degree in it. To see an entirely disinterested girl quite happy is the most pleasant and extraordinary thing in the world. Women must want imagination, and they may thank God for it. One may perhaps infer that Georgiana Keats had sat as an unconscious model for some of the features of Piona, but there is a passage in another letter 
written to these young married people after they had settled in America that puts the matter in a different light. Your content in each other is a delight to me which I cannot express. The moon is now shining full and brilliant. She is the same to me in matter what you are to me in spirit. If you were here, my dear sister, I could not pronounce the words which I write to you from a distance. I have a tenderness for you and an admiration which I feel to be as great and more chaste than I have for any woman in the world. You will mention Fanny, his sister. Her character is not formed. Her identity does not press upon me as yours does. This suggests that some of the qualities that appear in the sketch of Diana were derived from the warm affection and admiration that Keats felt for Georgiana. His sister was at this time only fourteen years of age, and while the tone of warm affection in which Endymion speaks to Peona corresponds well with that pervading the really delightful letters that Keats both at this time and afterwards wrote to her, we can hardly suppose that her opinion as to the wisdom or otherwise of his devoting himself to the life of a poet was very pronounced. It is not, of course, to be supposed that either Georgiana or Fanny is at all closely represented in the character of Peona, but it may well be the case, as the passages quoted from his letters suggest, that the affectionate regard that Keats entertained for them was at the back of his mind in some parts of the story and influenced what he wrote. Fanny Keats. It is perhaps worth noting that Mr. Locker Lampson, who met Fanny many years later in Rome, she was married to Senor Valentin Llanos, a Spanish man of letters, found her, both in the matter of her affection for her brother John, and her failure to understand him, singularly like the Peona of the poem. Whilst I was in Rome, Mr. Seven introduced me to Monsieur and Madame Valentin de Llanos, a kindly couple. He was a Spaniard, lean, silent, dusky, and literary, the author of Don Esteban and Sandoval. She was fat, blonde, and lymphatic, and both were elderly. She was John Keats' sister. I had a good deal of talk with her, or rather, at her, for she was not very responsive. I was disappointed, for I remember that my sprightliness made her yawn. She seemed inert, and had nothing to tell me of her wizard brother, of whom she spoke as a mystery, with a vague admiration, but a genuine affection. She was simple and natural. I believe she is a very worthy woman. End of section 1section two of an interpretation of keats endymion by henry clement notcutt this librivox recording is in the public domain book two the story in the second book we are taken down into a region away from all the stir and movement of human life endymion wandering in the forest is still in a restless and dissatisfied mood notwithstanding his promise to Peona, when his fancy is caught by a bud from which emerges a golden butterfly. Line 61. He follows it, and is led to the mouth of a cavern, where a nymph, rising from a fountain, warns him that he has yet far to go before he can attain to what he is striving after. Line 123. In response to a voice calling to him from the cavern, he makes his way down, and finds himself in a strange, though beautiful, region, from which all sign of human life has passed away. In the course of his wanderings, he comes upon a temple with many ramifications. Line 257. He is led into a chamber, where he sees Adonis sleeping, and while he is there, Venus comes and carries Adonis away. Line 581. He passes some magic fountains, and is delighted with the changing shapes that they assume. Line 606. He has a vision of Sibylle. Line 640. And then, the path failing him, he is carried by an eagle to a quiet bower. Line 670. Where his long pursuit is rewarded by a fuller revelation of his heavenly love than has yet been granted to him. 
after she has left him he sees the pursuit of arethusa by alpheus line nine hundred and thirty six and sympathizes with their pains and suddenly he finds himself moving in the depths of the ocean our study of the first book has led us to the conclusion that in the story of the strange experiences through which endymion passed there is pictured the gradual awakening of keats to the possibility that he might hope to achieve fame as a poet and the black despondency that settled down upon him in the long periods of waiting between the somewhat rare occasions when his hopes shone brightly in the second book the story is continued the hope once awakened in him could not be crushed by fears or hesitations even though these might prevail for a time and there is now set before us in picturesque form the process of training that had to be undergone in order that the poet might be made fit for the realization of his ideal so sidney colvin has admirably described the way in which the mind of keats naturally worked when he conceives or wishes to express general ideas his only way of doing so is by calling up from the multitudes of concrete images with which his memory and imagination are haunted such as strike him as fitted by their colour and significance their quality of association and suggestion to stand for and symbolise the abstractions working in his mind and in this concrete and figurative fashion he will be found by those who take the pains to follow him to think coherently and purposefully enough its meaning the images with which we meet in the second book may at first seem strange and bizarre the winding passages of the underground world the silver grots the orbed diamond the forsaken temple the magic fountains these may well be called wild and fantastic imaginations beneath which keats has so effectively hidden his symbolic purpose that readers by no means unsympathetic have been driven to doubt whether it is there at all even sir sidney colvin referring primarily to the description of the magic fountains that kept on changing their form gives up the riddle and says this and much else on the underground journey seems to be the outcome of pure fancy and daydreaming on the poet's part without symbolic purpose yet one cannot but feel that it is unlikely that keats would allow himself to wander aimlessly from the point in a poem dealing with a subject that was to him of all things most vital and sacred especially when one bears in mind the fact that it was just through such images that his ideas seemed most naturally to find expression one need not abandon the hope that even in the strange and fantastic symbolism of this book keats will be found by those who take the pains to follow him to think coherently and purposefully enough the meaning then that is suggested as underlying the symbolism of this book is mainly a personal one keats is continuing the story of his preparation for the work of a poet he tells us how he could not put aside the longing that he might some day be found worthy of this high calling however far away such an ideal might seem and how by what seemed a happy chance he was led to enter upon an earnest and thorough study of some of the great classical poets he tells us how fascinating he found the study and yet how at times he was oppressed by what seemed its deadness and want of relation to life as he knew it and then we see how he came to recognize a greater beauty and significance in some of the old legends than he had hitherto perceived and finally he pictures the renewed assurance that came to him that he would one day reach the goal towards which he was striving we must now examine the details of the story with a view to ascertaining how far the interpretation here suggested is supported by them endymion has found himself unable to return to his former life of healthy activity as he had told peona he would do he cannot shake off the influence of the vision that has called to him again and again with growing clearness and the interpretation of this part of the story follows naturally upon that which we have already recognized in the first book when the idea of achieving fame as a poet 
had once laid hold of the mind of Keats, he could not shake it off. He might, at times, when the ideal seemed too far out of reach, resolve to turn back to medicine and surgery, and make a renewed effort to fit himself in the normal way for this profession. But the call of poetry became more and more insistent, and no effort of will, and no pressure from his guardian, could drive it out of his mind. The Episode of the Butterfly The incident that breaks in upon his mood of depression leads on to the journey underground with which this book is mainly concerned. Endymion is sitting by a shady spring and elbow deep with feverous fingering stems the upbursting cold. A wild rose tree pavilions him in bloom and he doth see a bud which snares his fancy. Lo, but now he plucks it, dips its stalk in the water. How it swells, it buds, it flowers beneath his sight, and in the middle there is softly pite a golden butterfly, upon whose wings there must be surely charactered strange things, for with wide eye he wonders and smiles oft. Line 53 Endymion follows his little herald as it flutters away, and in the pursuit his mood of languor is changed into eagerness. It leads him to the side of a fountain pouring out near the mouth of a cavern. As it sips from the stream, it vanishes, but soon afterwards Endymion hears a voice calling to him, and looking round, he sees the nymph of the fountain, who tells him that it is she who, in the form of the butterfly, has led him to this place, and warns him that he has yet far to travel before he can hope to obtain the object of his desires. Footnote. This point has not always been understood, but it appears to be a necessary inference from the text. All I dare to say is that I pity thee, that on this day I have been thy guide. Book 2, line 121. End footnote. She vanishes, and Endymion is left with a sense of perplexity and disappointment. He watches the moon, now shining brightly, and though he does not recognise her oneness with his divine visitant, his spirit is stirred with an intense longing. He feels that he is almost sailing with her through the dizzy sky. Line 187. And as his passionate longing grows almost too great to bear, he hears a voice calling to him from the cavern and bidding him descend. Its Meaning The view that is to be taken of the meaning of this episode must depend on the interpretation that is given to the story of the underground wanderings of Endymion, to which it serves as an introduction. This will be considered in its place, but for the moment, it may be taken as a working assumption that these wanderings are intended to represent the course of study in classical poetry that Keats carried on for some time. With this as a clue, one is led to recognise that Keats is here depicting an experience of which no other record remains, though we know that he must, at some time, have passed through it. He was not much more than eight years old when he began to attend Mr. Clark's school at Enfield. And how soon he took up the study of Latin, we do not know. But we do know that, at some period, probably during the last two years of his school life, classical story and poetry began to exercise a fascination upon him that is not usual in the case of a schoolboy. And we may gather that he is picturing to us his recollection of the occasion when he first felt this fascination. The actual experience vivid though it may have been in the recollection of Keats, is presented to us in a manner that makes it by no means easy to recognise the meaning of the details. It reminds one of a photograph taken from an aeroplane, which, though concerned with actual and even familiar objects, shows them in a way that is difficult to interpret. But, read in the light of the idea stated above, it appears to mean that on some occasion when Keats was deep in meditation, turning over the pages of some book, possibly L'Empereur's Classical Dictionary, which, as Cowden Clark tells us, he appeared to learn during the latter months of his school life, 
he lighted upon some legend or story that snared his fancy he read it and became interested in it and turning from the bare outline given in l'empriere the bud to the pages of ovid or virgil in which it was told at length with all the beauty of their verse he found more charm and meaning in it than he had at first recognized it flowers beneath his sight he followed it up through the different writers that had touched it and found the pursuit full of interest and pleasure it seemed he flew the way so easy was line sixty nine at length the pursuit came to an end the immediate interest of the story was exhausted and he began to realize what it had to tell him with regard to his poetical ambitions the story transformed itself into a warning delightful as he had found it the little investigation that he had carried out had opened his eyes to the limitations of his own knowledge and he began to realize that he must wander far in other regions before he could hope to attain to his ideal he felt discouraged he had thought more than once that he was on the verge of the fulfillment of his hopes he had encamped to take a fancied city of delight line 143 only to meet with disappointment and failure the verses that he had written could not even in his own judgment be called poetry yet he could not abandon hope and as he dwelt upon the beauty of poetry in itself the achievement of the poet loomed more and more glorious in his imagination until there seemed to be nothing else worth living for and realizing that to become worthy of such achievement he must bury himself in a course of earnest and prolonged study he resolved to enter upon it forthwith oh for ten years cried keats in another place that i may overwhelm myself in poetry so i may do the deed that my own soul has to itself decreed footnote from sleep and poetry line ninety six end footnote the journey underground the rest of this book is concerned with endymion's adventures underground and it may be noted at the outset as bearing upon the interpretation that has been suggested that the region through which he passes is one from which all human life has departed there are some remains of man's handiwork of which the shrine with the image of diana is the most striking but the impression left is that these courts and passages have long been silent and forsaken they are a fitting symbol of the literature of an age long gone by there are near the opening of this part of the story a few lines which it would be hard to match as a description of classical literature as a whole dark nor light the region nor bright nor sombre holy but mingled up a gleaming melancholy a dusky empire and its diadems one faint eternal eventide of gems line two hundred and twenty one the imperfect and partial understanding of these old writers which is all that is possible in these latter days together with the unfading clear-cut beauty of numberless passages in them is suggested here with a skill and sureness of touch that keats did not often attain to at this period of his work when tennyson tried to describe the kind of beauty that he had found in the classical poets he used the same image jewels five words long that on the stretched forefinger of all time sparkle for ever footnote the princess canto two line three hundred and fifty five end footnote the pleasure that endymion found in exploring this new region twas far too strange and wonderful for sadness sharpening by degrees his appetite to dive into the deepest line 219 may be taken as a reminiscence of the delight with which keats plunged into his classical studies when he had once begun to feel the fascination of them he was at work says cowden clark before the first school hour began and that was at seven o'clock almost all the intervening times of recreation were so devoted and during the afternoon holidays when all were at play he would be in the school almost the only one 
had his Latin or French translation. The track that Endymion followed is described in some detail. We hear of a vein of gold, line 226, metal woof like Vulcan's rainbow, line 230, of silver grots or giant range of sapphire columns or fantastic bridge athwart a flood of crystal, line 237. The path leads along a track with all its lines abrupt and angular, line 228, now entering a vast entre, where the monstrous roof curves hugely, line 231, now leading through winding passages, line 235, or crossing a ridge, that o'er the vast beneath towers like an ocean cliff, line 240, and the description suggests, on the one hand, the qualities that are characteristic of ancient classical poetry, as contrasted with that of the modern romantic school, the severity, the colder, harder kind of beauty, and, on the other, the great variety of interest and outlook to be met with as one passes from one to another of the great writers of Greece and Rome. The Orbed Diamond A little later, Endymion came in sight of An Orbed Diamond, set to fray old darkness from his throne. Twas like the sun uprisen o'er chaos. Line 245 And the amazement that he felt in looking at it, so great that his bosom grew chilly and numb, line 243, reminds us of the feelings attributed to Cortez and his men, who looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent, upon a peak in Darien, and probably refers to the same experience when Keats first looked into Chapman's Homer. And this interpretation is confirmed by the suggestion that the words carry of a light set to shine, in a region that was all dark before. It is at this point, indeed, that Keats gives us a plain intimation of the meaning of the story, for he tells us that the wonders of this region are past the wit of any spirit to tell, but one of those who, when this planet's sphering time doth close, will be its high remembrances. Who they? The mighty ones who have made eternal day for Greece and England. Line 249 The Temple Endymion now came to a temple, so complete and true in sacred custom that he well nigh feared to search it inwards. Line 257 With feelings of awe he approached and looked down sidelong aisles and into niches old. Line 264 And then began to thread all courts and passages where silence dead, roused by his whispering footsteps, murmured faint. And long he traversed, to and fro, to acquaint himself with every mystery and awe. Line 266 It seems likely that, in the description of the minute and careful way in which Endymion examined this temple, Keats has embodied his recollections of his own study of Virgil's Aeneid. Footnote Colvin, Life of Keats, page 184, takes the latter part of this description to refer to some other building than the temple in which stands the image of Diana. But it seems better to regard the whole passage, down to line 270, as relating to the same temple. The fair shrine beyond which stands the quivered Diana is in the chief hall of the temple, book 1, line 298. Endymion first sees this, through a long pillared vista, line 260, so that the temple is not a small building, and the other aisles and courts and passages may be naturally taken as forming part of it. End footnote. Cowden Clark tells us that he was so fascinated with this epic that before leaving school he had voluntarily translated in writing a considerable portion of it. Nor did his apprenticeship to Mr. Hammond lessen his enthusiasm for, at Edmonton, he plunged back into his school occupations of reading and translating whenever he could spare the time. He finished, at this time, his prose version of the Aeneid, and the recollection must have been a pleasant one to have inspired such lines as those italicised above. 
one would have to seek far to find such a perfect description of the sensations aroused as one makes one's way with wonder and admiration through this great poem of days long gone by at length endymion grew wearied and sat down before the moor of a wide outlet to think about what he had seen there when new wonders ceased to float before and thoughts of self came on how crude and sore the journey homeward to habitual self line two hundred and seventy four if one tries to enter into the feelings of keats when he had completed his translation of the aeneid one can well imagine that he had become conscious of a new standard of poetical expression he had begun to realize as he had never done before what a value belonged to the choice of the mot juste he had felt all the charm of the muses often flowering in a lonely word and he realized painfully how far his own attempts fell short of this standard his verses would indeed seem crude his recognition of his own limitations might well make him feel sore his aspirations for poetic fame appeared a mad pursuing of the fog-born elf whose flitting lantern through rude nettle briar cheats us into a swamp into a fire line two hundred and seventy seven but soon another feeling became more prominent he was oppressed by the loneliness of the place and the deadness of his surroundings he longed to see the sky the rivers the flowers and the grass he was cut off from all these things he was in a region from which all life had departed and the work to which he felt himself called could not be accomplished in such a place no exclaimed he why should i tarry here no loudly echoed times innumerable line two hundred and ninety five for the romantic poets great as was their admiration for the true classics felt that they had to speak out a living message to a living world and that no mere imitation of the methods of a bygone age could accomplish this so he returned into the temple and reaching the shrine of diana prayed to her that as she does not waste her loveliness in dismal elements line three hundred and twelve so he may be delivered from the rapacious deep and brought to where he can once more hear the linnet's note line three hundred and twenty two and in this passionate cry we may recognize a feeling in the mind of keats that greatly as these works that he had been studying were to be admired for their perfection of form their brilliancy of expression and their variety of interest yet they belonged to another age another race of men and were lacking in fresh and living significance for the world of his day but as in answer to the prayer of endymion there sprang up through the marble floor of the temple a growth of leaves and flowers nor in one spot alone the floral pride in a long whispering birth enchanted grew before his footsteps line three hundred and forty five so keats came to realize that the eternal principles of life might even yet find expression through the seemingly dead pages of these poets of a bygone age cheered by this assurance which would remind him of the occasion when the first revelation of divine beauty was vouchsafed to him line five hundred and fifty four and following endymion started off once more increasing still in heart and pleasant sense line three hundred and fifty one before long he caught the sound of music and he was deeply stirred it was a hopeful sign and showed that his ear must now be more finely attuned to the melodies of heaven for when this same supernatural music had before broken in smoothest echoes through copse-clad valleys line a hundred and nineteen it was only the children the heralds of the coming day who were given power to hear it so entranced was he by the music that it was only through the leading of a heavenly guide benignant that he passed safely through the thousand mazes till at last with sudden step he came upon a chamber myrtle walled embowered high line three hundred and eighty eight where lay adonis sleeping guarded by cupids venus and adonis 
Endymion, though a wanderer from upper day, is welcomed, and is feasted with wine and fruit and manna, while there is told to him the story of the passion of Venus for Adonis, of the fate that befell him, and of the decree by which his death, medicined to a lengthy drowsiness, was changed each summer time to life. Soon Venus herself comes down, and after speaking words of encouragement to Endymion, carries Adonis away with her. So ends this episode. It represents the fulfilment of the promise of the life that was to be discovered in these old legends. Keats is still trying, by means of images, to symbolise the abstractions working in his mind, but the meaning of the images here is not obscure. He is telling us how, after he had first recognised that there was something more in his old legends than the dead perfection of an obsolete poetry, one of them at least blossomed out richly and filled him with delight, and, while the revelation lasted, while a sense of the living truth embodied in the story was full upon him, the world of classic poetry no longer seemed dim and lonely. It was full of warmth and light and music and meaning. As Sir Sidney Colwyn has remarked, to rescue the mind of England from this mode of deadness was part of the work of the poetical revival of 1800 and onwards, and Keats was the poet who has contributed most to the task. It was his gift to make live by imagination, whether in few words or in many, every ancient fable that came up in his mind. He could follow out a classic myth from a mere hint to its recesses and find the human beauty and tenderness that lurk there. At length the inspiration passed, the earth closed, gave a solitary moan, and left him once again in twilight lone. Line 586 Endymion was greatly cheered by what he had seen. He felt assured of happy times, when all he had endured would seem a feather to the mighty prize, so with unusual gladness on he hies. Line 590 And in these words, we may take it, that Keats is recalling the feeling of encouragement and pleasure with which, after the revelation that he has pictured for us above, he turned again to the study of the classics with a fuller assurance that he would gain from them guidance and inspiration for his poetical work. The path that he follows is described by images similar to those in which the earlier part of the underground journey is set before us. He passes through caves and palaces of mottled ore, gold dome, a crystal wall and turquoise floor, black polished porticos of awful shade, and, at the last, a diamond balustrade. Line 594. And the suggestion, as before, is that of a great and wonderful beauty, but a beauty that is hard and cold and without life, such as is usually felt to be the characteristic of the greater part of classical poetry. The Magic Fountains but now Endymion comes upon a new marvel. The path which he is following brings him just above the silvery heads of a thousand fountains so that he could dash the waters with his spear. But at the splash, done heedlessly, those spouting columns rose sudden a poplar's height and gan to enclose his diamond path with fretwork streaming round alive. Line 603 Endymion dwelt long on the strangeness of the scene, and the detail with which it is described suggests that he gave to it the same close attention as he had previously devoted to the temple which he had reached in the earlier part of his wanderings. The whole description may, at first, appear fantastic in the extreme, but, following the clue that has led us to this point, we recognise that Keats is telling us how, after his study of Virgil, he went on to make himself thoroughly acquainted with the poems of Ovid, more especially with the Metamorphoses. Every minute space, so the description runs, the streams with changed magic interlace, sometimes like delicatest lattices covered with crystal vines, then weeping trees, moving about as in a gentle wind, 
which in a wink to watery gauze refined poured into shapes of curtain canopies spangled and rich with liquid broideries of flowers peacocks swans and naiads fair swifter than lightning went these wonders rare and then the water into stubborn streams collecting mimicked the wrought oaken beams pillars and frieze and high fantastic roof of those dusk places in times far aloof cathedrals called line six hundred and thirteen ovid's metamorphoses it was from ovid's metamorphoses says colvin as englished by that excellent jacobean translator george sandys that keats more than from any other source made himself familiar with the details of classic fable evidences of this are strewn freely over the pages of endymion the scene of the sleep of adonis and the coming of venus to awake him is drawn from the tenth book of the metamorphoses the description of sibylle lines 639 to 649 is imitated from a passage in the same book where venus is represented as telling to adonis the story of atalanta the pursuit of arethusa by alpheus line 916 comes from the fifth book and that of glaucus and scylla book three is given in the thirteenth and twenty-fourth books this free use of ovid added to the emphasis which is laid throughout this passage on the alterations that are taking place in the form and significance of the magic fountains leaves little room for doubt as to the meaning of the poet he may have thought that in making use of the expressions changed magic line 613 and founts protean line 627 he was giving a sufficiently broad hint of his purpose sibylle bidding farewell to these sights endymion passes on and soon sees the vision of sibylle to which allusion has already been made sibylle wife of cronus and mother of the gods may be taken to represent the fount and source of all these legends in which the poet is now beginning to perceive a deeper meaning and he has this brief glimpse of her shortly before his wanderings in the region of classical poetry are crowned with their great reward for at this point he finds that the diamond path that he has been following ends abruptly in mid-air in his perplexity endymion asks for divine help and there comes to him a large eagle on which he flings himself and is borne down through unknown things till exhaled asphodel and rose with spicy fannings interbreathed came swelling forth line six hundred and sixty three diana the eagle lands him in the greenest nook of a jasmine bower all bestrown with golden moss he wanders through verdant cave and cell and feels a swell of sudden exultation an intense longing for his heavenly love comes upon him he knows however that no passionate striving of spirit will bring her to him and yielding quietly to the influences by which he feels himself to be surrounded suddenly he finds that she is with him even now he does not realize the full measure of the glory that is his but the period of their intercourse is more prolonged more intimate and more complete than ever it has been before this is the climax of the second book and it is evidently intended to set forth by means of picture and imagery some part of the experience through which the poet passed in the course of his efforts to attain to the understanding of the innermost mysteries of poetry we may regard him as telling us in the course of this book of some incident that awakened his interest in classical poetry and that led to his plunging into a deep and thorough study of certain parts of it more especially the aeneid of virgil and the metamorphoses of ovid of the curiosity and interest which the study aroused in him of the discouragement that came upon him as he reflected that this was the expression of the mind of an age that had long passed away whose aim in life and mode of thought and manner of speech seemed to have little or no meaning for the men and women of his day of the wonder and delight which he felt when as by a revelation he became aware of a deeper and richer meaning 
that lay beneath the surface of these old myths and legends, and then how he reached a point where it seemed to him that classical poetry had done for him all that it could do in the way of leading him to the ideal that he was seeking. It was at this time when all the course of painful striving through which he had gone seemed to have led to no tangible result, that there came to him an inspiration, as from some divine source, which carried him right into the very presence of the spirit of perfect poetry. And this mood of exaltation and attainment lasted longer and was more complete than ever before. And, though he knew, even while the mood was upon him, that it could not endure, but would die away after a time, yet he felt cheered and encouraged, for he knew that he was coming nearer and nearer to the realisation of the full powers, the high ideal, towards which he was striving. This appears to be the meaning, as far as one has been able to trace it, that Keats intended to convey in this book, and while we may feel that the climax is told in a manner not worthy of the loftiness of the experience that it is intended to represent, we must, at the same time, recognise that it reveals something of the earnestness and intensity with which Keats pursued his aims and ideals. The pleasure that comes from the exercise of the creative instinct is shared by many. The child, who draws the picture of a cow, or carves his little boat of bark, knows something of it. The man who lays out a garden, or designs a house, shares in it. The writer of verse, that others can only read with a smile, has felt some thrill of pleasure in the making of it. For which of us can hope to enter into the joy of the poet, who has produced a masterpiece able to stir thousands of hearts by its subtle magic? Our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. Or, thou wast not born for death, immortal bird. This is the level of attainment, with the rapture that must belong to it, that Keats has attempted to depict for us in this book. Endymion, awaking out of his great experience, finds that he is alone. He feels sad and forlorn, but no longer resentful, as he had been on former occasions when these wonderful visitations had passed. He sat down in a marvellous grotto and thought over the story of his life, and, coming down to this latest experience, he began to wonder what he still had to endure before he could come to the full realisation of his hopes. As he pondered, he heard a noise, and soon, on either side out gushed, with misty spray, a copious spring, and both together dashed swift, mad, fantastic round the rocks. Line 918 Alpheus and Arethusa it was Alpheus in pursuit of Arethusa. She longs to yield, but fears the wrath of Diana. And Endymion, moved with a fellow feeling of pity for their longings unfulfilled, prays to his still unknown goddess to have compassion on them and make them happy. Then, turning, he moved along a sandy path and found that the visions of the earth were gone and fled. He saw the giant sea above his head. Line 1022. The significance of this incident, with which the second book closes, appears to be twofold. It is, in the first place, a fresh illustration of the life and power that may be found in these old stories for those who have sympathy and insight to enter into their spirit. And there is further the suggestion, preparing the way for one aspect of what is to follow in the next book, that Endymion is coming to be less absorbed in his own perplexities and troubles, and is learning to look with a feeling of sympathy upon the difficulties of others, and this marks an important advance in the process of his training. The Introduction to the Second Book If we now turn to the lines that form the introduction to this book, we find that they bear out the interpretation to which the study of the rest of the book has led us. The essence of them is contained in the first seven lines, and the remainder of the passage is merely expansion and illustration of the one idea stated at the beginning. O sovereign power of love! O grief! O balm! All records, saving thine, come cool and calm and shadowy through the mist of past years. For others, good or bad, hatred and tears have become indolent, 
but touching thine one sigh doth echo one poor sob doth pine one kiss brings honeydew from buried days line one and he goes on to say that the tale of the wars around troy or of the campaigns of alexander has little power to move us while our souls thrill with responsive sympathy when we hear such stories as those of troilus and cressida or of imogen so it will be remembered a large part of classical poetry is imaged as cold and lifeless its beauty is like that of the diamond or sapphire but where it enshrines the passion of love it pulsates with life such stories as those of venus and adonis or of the river lovers still retain their power to rouse our sympathy more than the experience of keats in working out the interpretation of this book it has been convening to deal with it primarily as a record of the personal experience of keats but here no less than in the first book it is necessary to bear in mind that the allegory has a wider significance and is intended to represent the process of training which may be regarded as desirable if not necessary for anyone who aspires to the name of poet it is evident that the journey of endymion suggests a much more extensive study of classical literature than keats ever had the opportunity of carrying out he did indeed come to know homer with as much completeness as the translation of chapman made possible he studied ovid both with the help of sandys and in the original text while as noted above he translated the whole of the aeneid for himself but beyond this his knowledge of the classics appears to have been derived from such secondary sources as Tuke's pantheon lomprier's classical dictionary and spencer's polymetus he was fully conscious however of the disadvantages of the limited range of his own knowledge and accordingly in describing endymion's wanderings through the dusky empire with its diadems he suggests a much wider range of study though the sketch is naturally coloured by reminiscences of what he knew best end of section